From the magnificent Midwest, this is the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you in part by Let's Get Real, where forensic accountant Tiffany Couch uses her financial skills to shine the light on the real issues we all face every day. If you would like to make decisions based on facts and information rather than on rhetoric and cultural pressures, go to letsgetreallife.com, a place where you can find tools to improve your communication skills and to increase your connection to humanity. That's letsgetreallife.com. Today on the show, we're going to talk with author Adam Alter about tech addiction and what it may be doing to your relationships at home. But first, a few quick announcements. The audio version of my new book, How to Be a Wife, is finally available. I know many of you have asked me, when is the audio version coming out? And I don't know why these things take so long, but they do. So it's ready now. Just go to Suzanne, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, Venker, V-E-N-K-E-R dot com slash shop. And you will find that book there. Also, don't forget to become a Patreon supporter. Just go to thesuzannebankershow.com and click on Become a Patron, where you'll find four very economical levels as well as free gifts just for signing up. And if you have a business you want to promote, there's even an option for that. Finally, if you're looking for marriage and relationship coaching, go to suzannebanker.com to sign up for your free 30-minute discovery call. Can't get your kids off their laptops or smartphones? What about your spouse? Does it sometimes appear that he or she is more in love with technology than with you? Welcome to the age of behavioral addiction, where half of the American population is addicted to at least one behavior. We obsess over our emails, Instagram likes, and Facebook feeds. We binge on TV episodes and YouTube videos. We work longer hours each year, and we spend an average of three hours each day using our smartphones. Half of us would rather suffer a broken bone than a broken phone, and millennial kids spend so much time in front of the screens that they struggle to interact with real, live humans. In this revolutionary book, psychologist and professor Adam Alter tracks the rise of behavioral addiction and explains why so many of today's products are irresistible. Though these miraculous products melt the miles that separate people across the globe. Their extraordinary and sometimes damaging magnetism is no accident. The companies that design these products tweak them over time until they become almost impossible to resist. By reverse engineering behavioral addiction, Alter explains how we can harness addictive products for the good to improve how we communicate with each other, spend and save our money, and set boundaries between work and play, and how we can mitigate their most damaging effects on our well-being as well as on the health of our relationships. So what I'm showing you here is the average 24-hour workday at three different points in history. 2007, 10 years ago, 2015, and then data that I collected actually only last week. And a lot of things haven't changed all that much. So we sleep roughly seven and a half to eight hours a day. Some people say that's declined slightly, but it hasn't changed much. We work eight and a half to nine hours a day, We engage in survival activities. These are things like eating and bathing and looking after kids about three hours a day. And that leaves this white space. That's our personal time. That space is incredibly important to us. That's the space where we do things that make us individuals. That's where hobbies happen, where we have close relationships, where we really think about our lives, where we get creative, where we zoom back and try to work out whether our lives have been meaningful. And of course, we get some of that from work as well. But when people look back on their lives and they wonder what their lives have been like at the end of their lives, you look at the last things they say, they are talking about those moments that happen in that white personal space. So it's sacred. It's important to us. Now, what I'm going to do is show you how much of that space is taken up by screens. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you about your book, Um, Such... I mean, I shouldn't even call it a timely subject. It's going to be obviously timely for many, many, many years to come. Um, And I think that it is dramatically affecting relationships. So we're going to talk about your book in general, and I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions, but I definitely want to hone in on on the marriage and relationships, and not even just marriage, but also parenting. That's That's a big thing, too, for people, for sure. So in your book, Irresistible, you write that technology is designed to be addictive and that the gratification it provides is similar to that of other addictive behaviors, such as drug abuse. So can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, sure. So the, the economy that you play in when you design a product that people should be consuming, like a, a social media platform, for example, is the attention economy, which basically means that you make more money the more time people spend glued to the, to the device, looking at the screen, paying attention to your product. And since we only have 24 hours a day and we spend a lot of that day doing other things, you have to compete for people's attention. And the way you do that is you embed various hooks in your products. And those hooks are designed to make the product as difficult as possible to put down. So the book is really an attempt to unpack what these products are and what it is about them that makes them so hard for us to resist. And what is it about, how do they, how does it connect to the brain as far as addiction goes? Like what are they, what are they banking on with our brains with respect to what they produce? Well, a big part of what they're doing is they're delivering unpredictable rewards, which is the same engine that makes casinos work so well. You know, that the unpredictability of when a ne the next jackpot will appear. So most of the things we do online have an uncertain outcome, and there's a chance we're going to get some big jackpot reward. It could be something like a post that gets lots of attention, lots of likes, lots of retweets, regrams, and so on. It could be people saying nice things to you in an email. When you open the email inbox, you see there's an email there. It's an email you've been waiting for, and that changes how you feel. Um, for teens, a lot of it, and, and young kids, it can be the kinds of interactions they get when they're playing games. It can be the kinds of interactions they have with their friends. So th these little rewards are embedded in almost everything we do online. That's a big part of it, but there are also other features. Um, you know, There are goals that are embedded in these programs as well. So the idea of, of reaching a certain number of followers or a certain number of likes or um, the, the kind of round numbers, you know, the idea that you're going to reach the number 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 or whatever it might be. And all of these kind of push us to use these products more than we otherwise would. So when you combine the rewards with these other artificial hooks that are embedded in the programs, it's, it's really, really difficult for us to resist them. So I'm thinking back to, I don't know how old you are, Adam, but when my husband and I, the first 10 years of our parenting life, there was no such thing as this. I mean, it was just barely even there. So phones did not come into our kids' world until they were teens. Um, and I look at just the people right behind us, and I just cannot even fathom what they're contending with in those early years with respect to technology. I mean, it makes my, it just makes me so sad because I feel fortunate now that we didn't even have to contend with it. Let's talk about what's lost in the parenting experience when it comes to what we're um, what we're thrown with with all these different technologies that are just exploding more and more and more. That certainly when we first had phones, I and most people I know could not have imagined that it would balloon the way that it has. Yeah, so I have young kids. I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And um, I obviously, having written this book, I've been very mindful about how much time they spend in front of screens. And even for me, this is difficult. Uh, my, my decision, my wife and I decided very early on, um, was that we would try to keep our kids away from screens until they were at least two. So no TV, no phones, no tablets, nothing like that. And, um, and we succeeded with my son, my oldest child. He's, he's now four. And for the first two years, he didn't experience screens. But as he approached the age of two, a lot of his friends started talking about Elmo, this mythical creature, Elmo. And he got really curious about what Elmo was. And we felt that, you know, there were downsides to being the only kid who hadn't yet seen Sesame Street, for example. And then, of course, we allowed him to watch Sesame Street. And the, comp the complexities are such that if you have kids who are close in age, you make a decision about one of them. You say no screens until you reach the age of two. But his sister was sitting there as he was watching his first episode of Sesame Street. And so she, mm -hmm. as, a, as a seven or eight month old, is watching the same thing. And so it was impossible to have the same rule for her. And so we, we did, we certainly noticed that you're asking what's lost. I, I think any moment your child is, is looking at a screen, connection is lost almost completely. You could sit on a couch and, and cuddle or you know, there are still some benefits you can get from that process as long as it doesn't take up too much of the day. But you can't truly have a connection with someone while, while there's a screen on. And that's even more true for kids who just are completely incapable of dividing their attention. When there's a screen anywhere near them, it, it sucks up 100% of their attention. So I, I really think the presence of screens, even in the background, just completely degrades the relationship that you can build with, with a child. Agreed, 100%. And of course, children are particularly vulnerable to tech addiction. Let's talk about why that is. I mean, for one thing, I know you talked about 
the, the lack of self-control that a child doesn't have that you and I, well, it's even difficult for adults, let's face it. So imagine for a child who hasn't yet um, exercised those muscles, so to speak. Yeah, it's 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 just a, a quirk of the way the brain develops. That the the first thing to develop when you to develop when you're very young is is largely re- responsible for a, emotional responses, instincts, things like that. So if you really want something but it's not good for you, it's very difficult for for you when you're young to deal with that. That's that's true not just of little kids, but of teens as well, and even into adolescence that can be difficult. Which is why you have so many self control and impulse issues among teens. Now, of course, these programs are designed, these apps are designed to be difficult for adults to resist as well. So when you put them in front of kids who don't have the same brain regions developed for self-control, it's really just borderline impossible for them to, 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 to move themselves away from the screen, to tear themselves away. And so you're putting kids in an impossible situation when you when you say to them, here is this thing that you know exists mm-hmm. that delivers these incredible rewards Mm -hmm. and now we want you not to use it. Exactly. It's really tough for them. And then, of course, what you're modeling. We can't forget that, right? If you're doing it as a parent all the time, obviously you cannot make those stipulations on the kids. That does not fly. (laughs) It's it's true. It's one of the really interesting changes in the last, I'd say, 18 months or so in in my conversations with, with adults and kids is that when I first started talking about this topic about six or seven years ago, it, it was largely to parents who weren't sure how to help their kids or what to do about their kids' use of screens. Th- there's been this really interesting shift where kids over the last few years who've grown up around screens have started to sort of plead with their parents, mm. please stop using <clears throat> screens. And so it's no. going in the opposite direction now that older kids in particular, teens are saying to me, I just wish my parents would stop using screens because I'm I'm trying to use screens less. And when I see them using those screens, it's, it's really, really difficult for me. So there's been this really interesting shift. Oh, I have read that. I mean, it's just, it's the whole thing is so mind blowing. And of course, the biggest, and it's unfortunate because the parents need, I mean, one of the things you want to do as an adult is teach. I know you wrote something. I don't know if you wrote this or if I read it in an interview, but you said that how kids don't know how to do something that's more, um, I don't know, I guess difficult now. So you has a, so there's a greater benefit for it in the future. So for example, reading instead of playing a game on the computer, for instance, or even playing a board game instead of watching something um, on TV, these types of activities that we know or should know as adults have more benefit. Um, but it's sort of like delayed. It's not the same kind of immediate gratification. You're not sort of sitting there stupefied in front of a screen. We're supposed to know that there's benefit to that. And so we have to turn it off so that we can show them there's another way to live. Right. And I think that's where it gets really messy because either you're that kind of parent or you're not really let's face it because it's harder it's a it's a lot harder because it's easy for parents who are really stressed out who want to zone out themselves yeah i mean the screen is a a wonderful babysitter if you're desperate and and that's that's something that parents have to resist as well but you're exactly right about the this idea of of long-term benefits and delaying gratification that's something adults are capable of doing kids just aren't they're looking for the most immediate reward possible And the the thing about a screen is when it's nearby, it delivers instant rewards in a way that almost no other experience does. So the the, the time that you have to put into learning how to read, to to grappling with the words on the page, there's great reward there that that really is is a lifetime worth of reward. But you you have this huge startup cost, this early cost, and there's a very steep learning curve for kids. And they have to be able to get through that. Now, if the alternative is it right now, I can pull out a screen and, and pay attention to that rather than focus on this thing that will in in time bring me benefits, they're almost always going to say, I'll just do the thing that brings the benefits right now. Absolutely. And I, I I always go back to my husband and I talk about this all the time. Back in the day when you didn't have this, have these things as an option, what happens is you as a family, whether it's the parent or the kid, you're, you're bumping up against this, this quiet time where there isn't anything to distract you. And then you would naturally, of course, go to a book or go to music or go to a game to fill that space. So that boredom, if you want to call it that, that quiet lended itself well to that. And of course, as long as there's a screen, like you just said, you're always bumping up against that immediate hump. How are you going to get through that? And if parents don't teach it, it's not going to be learned. Yeah, I think that's been one of the really, really interesting shifts that that um, that sort of natural grappling with boredom or downtime that we we all grew up doing, you know, everyone who grew up at a certain time, 
had had these moments and and those are really important moments it turns out they feel like they're idle and there's not much benefit that comes from them but a lot of our creativity a lot of our ingenuity comes during those times when when we have to find a new way to do something or you know you let your mind wander and you come up with new creative solutions to whatever's been bothering you and then of course you're forced into a situation where you have to make your own fun your own entertainment which is a really valuable life skill if you don't have to ever do that, yeah, and if you never have to do that because everything that you ever need, every form of entertainment you ever need visits itself upon you the minute oh. you turn on a, de- a device, you just never learn to do that. I, I mean, I could do a whole episode just on that one point and how that affects your life in all kinds of ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you don't learn how to come up against that time and, and fill it you know, in a healthy way. So I know one of the things that you learned when you were writing this book, which was really fascinating, was that tech titans promote their products publicly, but what did you learn that they, I guess you could say do or don't do, depending on how you phrase it, that um, might surprise some of us? Well, the same products they're promoting publicly, they don't let their kids use privately, which I found really fascinating. Uh, and there are lots of cases of this, and I think the most famous one is is Steve Jobs, who described the the iPad in particular in 2010 on the stage at Apple. He talked about how wonderful the device was. It was a tool for education. It made education more accessible. It was a tool for entertainment. And he basically said, you should have one. You, your kids should have one. And a few months later, there was a journalist at the New York Times who reached out to him and asked him, you know, how, how have your kids been finding the iPad? And he said in this interview, our kids don't use the iPad. We don't let them use it at home, which I, I found totally fascinating. And this this article unpacked this idea and, and exposed a number of tech titans in the similar position for saying things publicly that they weren't doing privately. So the people who know the most about these products are incredibly cautious about unleashing them on their own families, which I found troubling, obviously. Troubling and unethical. I mean, yeah. <laughs> why couldn't they have when they did this? I mean, there's still plenty of people who are adults who could buy the products, come out with some sort of statement. Hey, here's the caveat. Th- that's how you would have handled that. Very simple. Yeah. The most extreme example of this, I think it's it's not quite the same situation, but Sean Parker, who was one of the early investors in Facebook in 2017, was interviewed. And, and one of the questions was, what did you think about Facebook when you were creating it? What did you think about its effects on people and their well-being? And he said, well, two things. First of all, we didn't think about it much at all. We were agnostic about it. It wasn't something we really, we really thought that much about. And then he said, but actually, the truth is a lot of us were really worried about what this might do to kids, and especially kids, but also adults. And so he was very candid about it in this interview. It's a, a famous interview now that a lot of people have watched. And um, I just I think there wasn't really much of a moral compass at a lot of these companies in the early days, partly because the medium was so new. No one really knew exactly what mm-hmm. what effect it would have, but also partly because we were giving incredible amounts of power or incredible amounts of power being accrued by often 20 something year old males mm-hmm. who had not had families themselves, had no sense of what it meant for a, a parent to interact with a child or really what it was like to be an adult in the world. A lot of them just didn't have that that chip. Had, had it hadn't been fully developed. What is the factor that keeps a person wanting to click? I think there are a lot of different features that, that make it difficult for us to stop clicking. Uh, one of them is, is, as I've mentioned, this sort of unpredictable reward that's built into a lot of the programs we use. Um, so, you know, whenever you interact with a social media platform or, or with email or with pretty much anything on a screen, there, there is the chance of some kind of reward. It's usually a social reward. It's it's sometimes a financial reward, but it's always meaningful. And social rewards really do matter a lot to us. They they drive a lot of our well being. So the 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 promise of perhaps having a certain degree of engagement with a post is a big one. Uh, the possibility of opening an email or a text message that has some sort of benefit for you is a big one. Uh, people do other things online. They gamble online in in some countries. That's a big factor as well. Uh, playing video games online or apps online is is another big one. Um, all of these basically have the promise of potential rewards, and it's the unpredictability that makes them a lot like slot machines. You never know when the jackpot's going to arrive. Uh, but there's more than that, though. There's there's also the social connection that comes with a lot of these these programs, or at least the illusion of of social yeah. connection, because it's not the same as actually being truly socially connected to someone in the way that we've we've been as a species doing for you know thousands and thousands of years. 
And so I think it's 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 not just one thing, but when you bake all of these different features into the product, it ends up being very, very hard for us to resist. And I want to come back to that idea about what you just said about the difference between true connection <clears throat> and fake connection, because I think that is affecting the millennial generation in a huge way. Um, so I, I want to focus on that. But before we do that, I, I want to cover this one part that I think is really important to understand that I think you explained really well. Explain the difference between, say, surfing the internet for hours and sitting for that same amount of time in front of the TV and or reading a good book. In other words, what I'm getting at here is the stopping cues. I want to talk about that and, and how significant the difference between, say, reading a book and, and, and surfing the internet is with respect to that point you made. Yeah, so stopping cues are, are features that were baked into a lot of the products we used traditionally in the 20th century. If you think about the kinds of, of video experiences we had, a lot of them involved natural endpoints. So you would watch a show and then the show would end and then a week later you'd get the next episode. You'd watch for an hour and then the show would end and then you'd get the next episode an hour later. At the end of each episode, there was a natural stopping point, a point at which it was clear to you that it was time to move on and do something different with you know, the next six days and 23 hours until the next episode arrived. The same thing is true about how we read newspapers or books or, or pretty much anything else, um, that, that there is a natural endpoint to, to what we're doing. Now, in the last, I'd say, decade or so, tech companies have become very wise to this. And they know that one of the ways you get people to spend more time on a platform is to not give them a stopping cue that says it's time to leave. And so they've systematically eradicated those cues from their, their products the, the feed on, on social media platforms is bottomless. So you can keep scrolling basically forever and you'll always get new information. Um, if you're watching videos on any video platform like Netflix or YouTube or Hulu, there's post play built in, which basically means that the default after one video ends is that the next one will begin. Instead of the default being as it's traditionally been that when something ends, you have to act on that environment to create a new experience. All of these, these this change in defaults, this removal of these subtle suggestions that you move on has has made it incredibly difficult for us to say oh now's now it's time for me to leave because you basically just sit there inert and the, the experience just represents itself and suddenly there's more for you to consume and i think that's been one of the really big changes especially in the last decade decade and a half huge huge and you made a really great comparison when you're saying that books for example to use books as and i'm going to say this because i'm a big reader and not a, not a TV watcher. So in this house, it's like I have to get into a space <laughs> where there's no um, noise in order to to to, to do that. Um, but you said how books are demanding, meaning of your brain and of your thought process, whereas TV and internet puts us in a trans like state. I thought that was a really good comparison because what happens when you have to when you want to read a book or when you try to read a book? Yeah, there's 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 not that same mindlessness, right? You can't really zone out, and zoning out is is sort of the whole point of a lot of the experiences we have on screens. It's downtime. It's it's just not engaging with the world in any concerted way. And I have to say, I think there's a space for that in the yeah. world. Yeah, I think at the end of a long hard day, there's nothing better than vegging in front of a screen. But I, I think when the screen is always there, and when it's it's always offering that opportunity, it, it, it's so much easier to just say yes to that time and time again. And across the course of a lifetime, there are some, some stats now that suggest that this could be something we do for up to 15 or even 20 years of our lives, that we spend that much time in front of a small screen looking at, at you know, videos and other things, which is really scary. I mean, that's, that's a huge amount of time. Really scary. Um, okay, so I want to get into the meat of what I love to talk about and what we do here on the Suzanne Banker Show, and that's marriage and relationships. So let's talk about how all of this that we've just described, that you've just described, has the potential to, you know, harm, for lack of a better word, an otherwise healthy marriage or relationship, the different ways that that could happen. Um, so there are a lot of things that come to my mind. The first is, that remember how we were talking about how in the past before these things were there um you just naturally bumped up against that quiet time and would go you know have a conversation or read something or what have you well now because it's in our hands which was a big jump from even 10 15 years 10 or 15 years ago when you had to sit still at a computer now that you've got the phone there at all times if you don't specifically have time in the day i mean have 
a time or space in your life where you remove it from your pocket or your hand and have it in another room, you're constantly going to have a potential interruption for every conversation you have with your spouse. Yeah. So in order to have a healthy one, it really can't be there, can it? No, uh, it it can't. And there's actually really good evidence for this. And the evidence is it's true even for strangers, but it's more acute when we're talking about spousal relationships or relationships with loved ones, that if you have two strangers who are sitting and having a conversation, if there is a book on on the table between them, they develop a reasonably strong connection. If you replace the book with a phone, even if it's turned off and it's upside down, the mere presence of that phone degrades the relationship these people build. And one of the reasons for that is a phone is basically a portal to another world and or a whole series of other worlds. And it's incredibly distracting to have a phone anywhere near you, whether it's visible, whether you just know it happens to be around. It takes a part of your brain and, and outsources it and takes it elsewhere. And, and that basically means that the connection you're going to draw with people is going to be diminished for the, the mere presence of that phone. Now, that's true for the mere presence of the phone when, when you know, spouses are having a conversation or loved ones are having a conversation. But of course, it goes way beyond that. You, you see these, these families sitting at tables in restaurants and every single member of the family mm-hmm. from child to adult is sitting with a phone. So there's the huge distraction that comes from that. And then if you're sitting on a couch watching a show together, you know, we used to kind of bond over that experience. Now we multi-screen. So you've got your, each person has a phone out so there's no downtime, even in ad breaks, which are fast forwarded through anyway, for you to actually connect. So I just think there are so many opportunities for screens to come between us that that the biggest thing here is that those those small moments of connection that were so important for relationships for such a long time are just so much more difficult to create in an organic way. Amen. Yes, so much more difficult. It requires an incredible amount of discipline. And people aren't naturally... I mean, it's just human to to be distracted and to, um, you know, that FOMO, that fear of missing out problem <laughs> that a lot of people have um, of, of always wanting to be dialed in. But when you force yourself to put that away and go back to the time when it was just you and another human in that space, it's so powerful. You, you almost have to force people to just... Um, I mean, for example, one of the things you said I loved um, that I read in an interview that you gave um, was was if you were going to advise a friend on on qu- trying to quit their behavioral addictions, what would you suggest? And I'm going to read exactly what you wrote here because I printed it out because I loved it. Um, uh, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. In general, I'd say find more time to be in natural environments, to sit face to face with someone in a long conversation without any technology in the room. There should be times of the day where it looks like the 1950s or where you are, sorry, I had to turn the page, sitting in a room and you can't tell what era you are in. I loved that because, so this is an ongoing thing in our home because we, we pretty much raised our kids in a very old fashioned way. And there are, um, one of the shows that we love is the Waltons. (laughs) And I, (laughs) which a lot of people younger than me don't even know, but hopefully you do. So I, um, I'm always pointing out how this goes back to what we were saying about it was so much easier when those things weren't there because you've had these natural conversations or natural games or whatever that you would play. And now you have to create the environment purposefully, mindfully in order for those things to naturally occur. So there's that extra step that you have to take that they didn't back in the Walton days that is, you know, a pretty tall order. I don't think most people do this. So we're kind of weird and I do, and I've really, force that as much as possible over and we're almost empty nesters. So the parenting thing is kind of over, but um, I, you know, I, I would get a lot of trouble for, for, for the way that we did things because that's what I was doing. I was trying to force it. And I think it, and it actually worked out really well. Um, I still do it with my husband, even though the parent, my pa- parents, the, our kids are gone. Um, and because y- you know, I, I'd say that he has a little bit more difficulty, you know, making the phone and then, you know, putting it down, putting it in another room, although he does pretty well. 
Um, but all of which is to say, someone's going to have to force it in order for it to happen. Hopefully both parents are, and both partners are on board with that because what happens in so many marriages is that one person is and the other one's not receptive. And then what do you've got? Marital conflict. Absolutely. Yeah. This is a big discussion among, among, uh, parents but also just in any relationship that you've got to be on the same page just as you do about things like finances and attitudes to religion and all, all the other things that come into conversations you can add this new modern one that's yeah. come in in the last few years and it's it's a big one because it takes up such a huge portion of our lives so if you disagree on your policy with phones that's going to come up every single day and it's going to affect almost every interaction you have with your kids it's it's just going to be an, a, a present aspect of the relationship all the time and so finding a partner who agrees with you on these things is i think quite important it's the new extra dimension that needs to be considered yeah as if we needed another one for marriage i, know, but, but, I mean see and that's for your gen- i think you're a millennial yes i'm i'm borderline i'm 40 i think i'm i'm on the border of uh, gen x millennial yeah uh, i'll okay. take either label there you go there you go okay so i'm 52 so i um it, that had to happen organically in our marriage because all of this stuff was happening over the 22 years of our marriage where it was, it was entering our lives. So it, it takes time to sort of see how it's all going to play out and then realize, Oh wait, we have to have some rules and so on and so forth. But for the younger generation, you're absolutely right. They know going in when they're getting married, this is going to be a thing. So it's not going to have to be done piecemeal the way we figured it out. So speaking of millennials, I wanted to go back to, um, that whole issue of connection. And we know that this is something that millennials deal with more than any other generation because they're, they grew up with this stuff and that whole understanding of, um, what, what, what it is that you get from human face-to-face interaction, even if it's, and not even just face-to-face, but how about the telephones versus texting and anything like that, that requires more, some more face to face or, or hearing or seeing or what have you, how do you explain? I know you, you, um, you're a professor, right? So you talk to young people all the time, right? I do. Okay. How do you explain the difference when they've never really seen it? It's, it's interesting. I I've thought about this a lot and wondered whether this, this generation that grows up from a very young age in the presence of phones and screens that we didn't grow up in front of, whether they, they don't miss the same things we perhaps miss it's interesting that to me that often they do. So they'll say, you know, there are moments when they connect. You know, if, if you're if you're 23 or, or 50, I teach mainly grad students, so they're a little older, but some of them that I've taught are, are as young as 15 or 16. I teach a high school class occasionally. And and those kids in particular are really from from a very different world from the one that I grew up in. And and even they, they'll have moments where they really get into a deep, enriching conversation with a friend, or if they're out on a date when they're a little bit older. And there's a feeling you get from those experiences, those interactions, those, you know, a date that goes really well or a day when you're really connecting with a friend, that that depth of connection, I think there's no other way for humans to get the particular kind of set of emotions that comes from that, 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 that fulfillment. It's like a kind of nourishment that you can't get from other sources. And I think everyone experiences that sometimes. And when you accidentally experience that as a 15 or 16 or 20 or 25 year old, it's something you 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 experience and you say to yourself, that was really great. And that's something I want more of. So I've never come up with an audience that doesn't agree that this is a problem to some extent. And I don't think they're just humoring me. I, I really yeah. think for a lot of them, they, they genuinely yeah. feel, even though they're young and they've grown up around these devices, it's not totally lost on them. Most of them say, yes, this is a problem. And yes, I wish things were a bit different, even though I didn't experience anything anything different in my life. I understand you did. And and so I, I think I think the good news is, and I'm hopeful that even people who are born today in the year 2020, in 20 years, they're going to be saying, you know, we need to do things differently. I think they're going to demand it as well. Oh, I agree. I, I completely agree. Okay, so then just to close out, what is the the advice that you give for people, whether they're younger or older, who are concerned that they may be addicted and who know they spend too much time on their devices than they should, and they just don't know where to begin to just change their life in terms of getting back the kind of thing we're talking about with human connection and quiet time and all of that? Well, the one thing you can ask yourself, it's I think it's a very good litmus test, is how much of the day do you spend where you can't reach your phone without moving your feet or you can reach your phone with, without moving your feet? So most people, 75 to 80% of adults, 
say that for 24 hours a day, the phone is so close by or in a pocket or on a nightstand that they can reach it without having to move. And that basically means that it may not be implanted in our bodies yet, but it's it may as well functionally be an implant. It's part of who we are. And that's, that's going to make it very hard for us to resist. So the single biggest thing you can do is to increase the number of hours each day when your phone is out of reach and when you're not in the presence of a screen. And there are a few easy ways to do that. One is to take a, a, a thing that happens every day, an occasion like dinner, for example, and say, all right, dinner time in my, my family, or even if you're alone, if you're, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are or what context it's in, you could make a rule that whenever I'm having dinner, my phone will be as far as physically possible away from me. And that means if I'm home, that it's going to be in a drawer in a different room or in a box. We have a little box in our kitchen that we put our phones in. It could be you know, if you're out having dinner with friends, it could be in a bag that's under the table or something like that. Um, so that's the first thing. You, you probably want to do more than that, though. Uh, phones really influence bedtime and sleeping and our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. And so a really smart thing to do is to use the phone until maybe 60 minutes before bed, an hour before bed, and then to put it away and not open it again until you've been awake for 30 to 60 minutes the next day. And it should not be in your in your room. If you suffer from any sleep issues, if you find it hard to fall asleep or stay asleep, if you do this for a few weeks, if you keep your phone out of your bedroom, I, I've almost never heard of anyone who doesn't say that makes a huge difference. Um, so, so really, I think the best thing we can do is to, to develop these habits, these, these very thoughtful, mindful ways of creating physical and time-based distance from our phones where, where we just don't have them around for as, as much time as they naturally seem to be around for most of us. And that'll go 60, 70 percent of the way there. Most people at that point say, well, I really look forward to these experiences. They start to expand it. They start to do it on weekends as well. Uh, I, I know that what we do, we have, as I said, a three year old and a four year old. We don't want to miss out on, on experiences. I want to have a phone with me so I can take photos. But I put the phone on airplane mode during the weekend so that I'm not interrupted by messages and emails and things. And I find that makes a huge difference to my my engagement, my de the de degree of connection I establish with my kids on the weekend. These are great, great, great suggestions. And 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 it, I think it's important to also throw in there. It's it's as you say, it's really critical that the phone is not in the vicinity. In other words, some people think, well, I'll just put it away in my pocket and I won't use it for the next 45 minutes. But what's the problem with that? Yeah, it's it's just it's there. It, it might vibrate. We even have phantom vibrations that we experience from our phones. So if you use your phone and you put it on vibrate mode for enough days, your body will start to feel vibrations even when they aren't there. So you really need your phone as far away as possible. It's right. uh, it's too distracting otherwise. And and you're just so right. All you can do is just encourage people to just try it, you know, just do it as a test for X amount of time. And you will see how really liberating it is to live without it. Like you're saying, people might love it so much they start to really up the ante as far as how much they, they don't use it. So, OK, tell everybody the name of your book once again. It's called Irresistible. And the subtitle is The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. Excellent. And where can um, people find out about you, Adam? They can find me. I have a, a homepage online that has all the, the sort of latest things that I'm writing and thinking about, including my next book. That's adamleealter.com. Um, I don't use social media much, but I do use Twitter a fair amount. <laughs> so that's probably not surprising. But my Twitter handle is adamleealter, A-D-A-M-L-E-E-A-L-T-E-R. And they, they can find my books in any bookstores, preferably smaller ones, but you can find it anywhere. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Suzanne. Thanks so much. Take care. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. 
women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. And now for the email of the day. This is from Robin. She writes, hi, Suzanne. I love your show. I have a question I hope you can address about millennial relationships. My husband and I have been married for four years and together for six. We have three children. I'm 30 and he's 27. He is Cuban. And I don't know if you know the stereotypes regarding Hispanic mothers, but they tend to be helicopter moms and baby their children for a very long time, especially their sons. So my husband didn't grow up with his dad, just his mom. And she never taught him how to take care of himself. Now that it's been years, I see how babied and overmothered he really was. And I feel like a lot of millennial guys are in the same boat. My question is, how do you help guys grow up when you're already married? Okay. She goes on to say, I try my best not to act like a mother figure and to respect him. And it helps, but he never saw a real man or father growing up. So I don't even think he understands what's missing. He's a good dad, so on and so forth. But he often looks to me to be the leader when I don't want to be. Okay. Very, very, very common problem. Uh, I have no experience with it personally because <laughs> my husband's quite the opposite. You can't, you can't tell him at all. Uh, he, he takes care of himself. Let's put it that way. He sort of was raised to left to his own devices as a kid. And so he became ultra independent and does everything himself. But anyway, I do see this and um, I know people in this boat and it's not easy. It is not easy. I mean, there's no easy way to say, oh, yeah, you know, here's what you do, and that'll just take care of it overnight. I do think that your only recourse is to, as difficult as it is and as long as it might take, to make sure that you're putting into action all the things that I talk about in my coaching sessions with the seven steps for having a peaceful and passionate relationship with your man, which basically is not directing his traffic, not taking over when he doesn't. And then people ask, well, what if he doesn't do anything? Well, at the end of the day, you know, it's sort of like, um, anything that you teach, if you, if you, um, foster it, you know, if you jump in and save the day, every time the person doesn't make, doesn't act, make a decision, you're essentially just allowing that to continue. So if you know that for a fact that your way isn't, that taking over isn't going to produce the result you want, you ultimately have to train yourself to respond differently. And that means as best as possible, always having him have to make the decisions for himself. And if he does, so for example, let's say you say, well, what if he won't make them? Okay. So then if he asks you, then you need to pump him up by giving him oodles of respect and assuming the best and saying, whatever you think, I trust you, you'll figure it out. Anything that emboldens him to become that person that his, as you, in this case, mother did not, did not allow him to do because she over mothered him and took care of everything for him. So if you know, that's the problem, the only solution is to do the opposite of what the mother did. And the tempting thing to do is to jump in and become the leader or the mom because He's not doing it, but all you're doing is exacerbating what you already know is the problem and you want to change it. So at the end of the day, it is going to come back on you. And it's, this is not something I can answer easily, really quickly here, by the way. I just wanted to address this particular question. It's something that is learned over time for you as the wife as to what are those things that you can do how can you respond? How can you behave? What can your attitude be on a daily basis to embolden your guy to become the man that his mom sort of didn't let him become? And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Banker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk with Joy Holman about the Supreme Court nomination. Really excited for that conversation. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Banker Show in the Facebook search bar and you'll find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. 
Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.